Thanks a lot. Um, I um, would like to thank for this chance to speak about one of my favorite topics. I'm much honored. Uh, and I will begin by uh, mentioning uh, how divergent views there are on um, the role of mathematics and logic in philosophy. To illustrate this, we can uh, have a look at two extreme views. One is the view that was expressed by uh, Jean Leroux d'Alembert in the 18th century, one of the major Enlightenment uh, philosophers. Although he was himself an able mathematician, he thought that mathematics should not be applied in areas where there was no certainty. So he described the, the way in which mathematics, or as he said, geometry, that meant about the same to him, uh, was used in areas um, like metaphysics and ethics, uh, and described it like saying that on all the pages one sees the grand words, axiom, theorem, corollary, etc. The authors of these works, he said, have apparently imagined that such words possess some secret quality that constitutes the essence of a demonstration, and that by writing which was to be demonstrated at the end of a proposition, they make something proved that wasn't proved before. But, he said, it's not to this method that geometry, that is mathematics, owes its certainty, but to the evidence and simplicity of its object. So the idea was one shouldn't apply mathematics to uncertain things because it's a misapplication. Uh, the contra view was, I believe, perhaps most boldly expressed by uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, in a text from uh, the early previous century that I like to quote, he said simply as follows, every philosophical problem when it is subjected to the necessary analysis and purification is found either to be not really philosophical at all or else to be in the sense in which we are using the word logical. And he also claimed that modern logic had introduced the same kind of advance in philosophy as Galilei introduced into physics when he introduced his mathematical, his mathematical methods uh, into um, mechanics. Uh, now, D'Alembert and Russell represent diametrically opposite standpoints on the usefulness of logical mathematical methods in philosophy. D'Alembert wanted to exclude them and Russell wanted philosophy to be conducted exclusively with these methods. But there is also an important agreement between the two. They both saw the application of such methods as a matter of an exact match. And D'Alembert considered such a match to be impossible. So since metaphysics and morals were inexact, mathematics, which is exact, was unsuitable for their treatment, whereas Russell considered those two, uh, such a match to be uh, possible. But we do not have to choose between these two extreme standpoints. There is a third standpoint, which we can find, uh, in fact, in a pupil of D'Alembert's, namely uh, Nicolas de Condorcet, who, who emphatically defended, and I would say very efficiently pursued, the use of formal methods in what he called the moral sciences, and what which is what we would call social science and moral philosophy, something like that. Uh, and he conceded that it was impossible to achieve the rigorousness of a geometrical proposition, but he said that still one could use these methods. In, in fact, in his eulogy to, to D'Alembert, perhaps a somewhat surprising place to introduce a criticism, but there he criticized uh, his former mentor and teacher for having 
become so fond of rigorous proofs uh, during his uh, long time as a uh, uh, mathematician that he had uh, sort of had his taste in the, for the other sciences influence, being too much influenced by that, and thereby he had, with a phrase which is also a bit unusual in the eulogy, put two narrow limits on the human mind. Uh, Condorcet said that in the sciences that were concerned with how to act, one would have to deal with less exactness, and he pointed at the use of uh, uh, probabilities for uh, that purpose. So if we follow Condorcet um, in this middle position, uh, which, although philosophers usually don't like middle positions, I think this is a very sensible position, so I think we should follow this one. Well, then logical mathematical studies of philosophical topics should aim at formal structures that correspond approximately to the uh, study ob objects of study, rather then engage in a futile uh, search for models that uh, have a perfect match. So these should be idealized models, just as models in the natural and social sciences are, namely models in which we abstract from some things in order to get a reasonably simplified and understandable picture of some other things. So this is very similar to, to the empirical sciences, but there is a big difference uh, where, between philosophy in the modern sense and, and um, the empirical sciences. Uh, I would just like to say that um, I now use the term philosophy in the modern sense, as we all tend to do anachron anachronistically about uh, endeavors that are um, intellectual endeavors that were, uh, are more than 200 years old because in that time at that time philosophy was a much wider concept uh, the difference is very can be seen very clearly from what uh, Galilei did because he was not the inventor of uh, mathematical models uh, of uh, mechanical uh, uh, phenomena. To the contrary, there was a tradition of that, and that was a tradition in which people even had discovered the absolutely crucial idea of uh, the position and movement of objects being functions of time. Uh, what the, the difference was really that where his predecessors, mostly the Oxford so-called calculatorus, they reasoned in the same way as a Euclidean ge geometer. They thought that they were thinking about motion and just as Euclid had thought about motion, uh, had ideas, developed intuitive ideas uh, about, uh, sorry, U Euclid was thinking about structures that did not move and he did that uh, intuitively and he tested essentially his, um, uh, conclusions against intuition and so on, whereas um, uh, and so the Oxford calculatorist did calculatorist did the same. They uh, thought that they could solve problems of motion in exactly the same way as uh, geometrical problems. So they did not have to perform any experiments, observations, whereas Galilei introduced the idea of. Uh, testing mathematical theories against observation. And that is, of course, the, the, what has provided us with uh, all the strengths of modern science in terms of combining theoretical models with empirical studies and testing these models uh, and thus being able to, to improve them. But we cannot do a Scalia, and that's where uh, Russell was, went wrong in, in the passage I mentioned, where I compared the role of logic in philosophy to the role of uh, Galilean mathematics in, in uh, physics. Uh, namely, that we cannot uh, 
test in the in the empirical way. I mean, if we are developing, say, a system of deontic logic, we are thinking of this as uh, rational normative reasoning, and we start out our constructions, our logical constructions, from our intuitions about rational normative reasoning. But then we cannot test them against some sort of uh, certified, uh, perfectly rational moral reasoner, because there is none. So essentially, we develop our intuitions, or develop our models from our intuitions, and we test them in various ways against the intuitions again. So uh, this is a sort of uh, more or less circular approach, which is the best we can do, uh, but which is not the same as the very uh, efficient ways in which models are, are used in, in uh, the empirical sciences. And that should uh, provide us with, I think, give us a reason for some humility about our ability to perfect our formal models. Uh, I think that formalization still is extremely useful in philosophy. It provides us with means to express and precisionize, to criticize and improve philosophical standpoints. But as I said, we don't have the good testing methods that there are in, in the empirical sciences. And the conclusion I think we should draw from this is to go for a methodological uh, pluralism and recognize that we are working with idealized models and that very often <clears throat> different models can help us understand uh, different things. Uh, Philosophy has often been described as proceeding by the adversary method, uh, which consists in you, uh, um, uh, you put forward a standpoint and someone else finds um, uh, an argument against the standpoint, and then you try to save your standpoint, and if you don't have to do so, you give it up. And that's, uh, or at least others think you should give it up. Uh, and the adversary method is very much, uh, I would say, based on a sort of uh, perfectionism, uh, which you can see, for instance, in how extremely implausible situations that have nothing to do with the realities of real moral life uh, are used as uh, allegedly uh, uh, decisive arguments against uh, moral theories. Um, um, and that such objections can be raised against all moral theories. So, so that's why we can go on fighting about them. As I said, I think a pluralist approach is more appropriate. I will use as an example uh, of, of, to make this a bit more concrete, uh, representations of belief. There is a long tradition of formal models in um, uh, epistemology, uh, and they are intended to, to represent and clarify aspects of uh, uh, human beliefs. Uh, the term belief has, of course, many meanings, but I will follow the tradition in this area and, and use it to refer to empirical beliefs, beliefs about what the world is like that we uh, live in. And these are uh, propositional attitudes, uh, uh, and we also have, of course, many other types of propositional attitudes. Uh, the attitudes uh, that are studied in epistemology uh, are attempts to uh, hold and express purely factual or value neutral attitudes uh, to the world for which I think we have very good, which I think we have very good reasons to try to have because we can manage the situation in the world better if we uh, do so and we can communicate better with each other if we 
know when we are communicating about what we believe the world is like and we and when we communicate about other attitudes uh, to the world uh, but uh, beliefs come in many forms and uh, there are quite a few uh, complexities, some of which can be uh, treated, I think, fairly well in formal models, but not always all of them in, in the same model. Uh, and one, I, I, would, I would like to emphasize one thing, which is that we do have beliefs that we consider to, uh, to be they um, uh, have no that they, they consider themselves to have no reason to doubt. They are not undoubtable. We could doubt them, but we have no reason to doubt them. These are the undoubted beliefs. And then we have uh, also uh, degrees of belief, which which we express like with words like uh, perhaps and and other such uh, notions. Uh, and when we start to, to make a uh, formal representation, we will easily see that these uh, beliefs that we don't doubt, they can be represented as uh, propositions or proposition representing sentences, uh, whereas the degrees of belief can be represented as uh, probabilities. Uh, of course, probabilities uh, are much more precise than the everyday expressions like perhaps and so on, but I think uh, they are uh, still a, um, a useful um, uh, construction. Uh, when something is sufficiently close to certain, we treat it as certain, but still we are uh, able to and sometimes have to uh, change those full beliefs. So that is um, a, a major problem for formal epistemology. How do we represent that we have full beliefs which we then uh, are willing to change? And this is no, no small issue because this happens all the time in our everyday lives. We believe something, we don't doubt it, but then receive some surprising information. The bus stop isn't where I took for granted it would be or whatever. And then we have to change a uh, full belief. And it's also extremely important in science because first of all, we can't do without full beliefs. If we were going to think about everything as uncertain, it would be cognitively too much of a burden. That applies to science as well. Science needs to keep some things as some claims as uh, provisionally just um, uh, uh, undoubted something we, we like all the things we write into a textbook and quite a few of the things, most of the things that were written into textbooks in science a couple of decades ago still stand, but a few of them have to be changed. Uh, and this is the great strength of science that it is able to change its full beliefs. If we are not willing to do that, then we will take a step from science to pseudoscience. You can find very good examples of this in climate science denial, for instance, where they keep up views about the role of the sun in climate change that were thoroughly disproved about 25 years ago, and still they go on to believe it. That's not science. Science requires that we are willing to and able to change our full beliefs. But if we try to introduce that into um, a uh, system based on probability theory, we will have some problems because uh, the, the most simple way to represent a full belief, something that is undoubted, is of course to assign to it probability one. And then with the standard approaches to probability change, it cannot be changed. Uh, 
And this is one of the major reasons why they have developed other theories, most famous is the AGM theory, but there are quite a few other theories of belief change, which actually start out with a set of uh, propositions, which are the full beliefs, and then discusses how they can be changed by various mechanisms, and these mechanisms do not uh, uh, represent uh, probabilities. I think it's essential when trying to, to model uh, uh, the beliefs, the human belief system, to, to pay some attention to what I said about cognitive limitations, which means that I think that models in which empirical beliefs cannot just be a set of uh, undoubted beliefs, but have to be treated all the time as, as if they have probabilities lower than one, uh, don't um, satisfy um, uh, that criterion. Uh, now, probabilities were originally constructed, I would say, with the purpose of representing random events. And one of the things we should uh, be willing to consider is that perhaps human rational belief change doesn't necessarily follow the mathematical laws uh, that uh, suit so perfectly <laughs> random events. Uh, to, to uh, think of, of other forms of uh, probabilities. Uh, so what we have then is two types of belief models. One is what we can call dichotomous belief models, where you talk about beliefs as a certain set of propositions and uh, a proposition is either a member of that set or not a member of that set. This goes back to the epistemic logic uh, from Hintika and others. Uh, and the modern forms are in the um, still rapidly growing area of uh, belief change theory, which has many ramifications. And beside these, uh, uh, Decotobus models, we have the models that represent beliefs as something that, uh, that has degrees, uh, and that the most important of those is uh, probability theories. Uh, I will focus on just one problem as an example of problems one has to, to deal with here. And I call it the uh, amnesia problem, which is that when we perform, um, it, it's a problem of, of standard probability theory, which is quite uh, tricky to deal with, which consists in that when uh, we uh, adopt a full belief uh, in the usual way of revising by a proposition, which is the standard way to change a set of probabilities, uh, then we will lose all our beliefs about what would be the case if that was wrong. So if I originally am uncertain about whether P or not P is true, I assign to it a probability somewhere between zero and one. Once I assign to either P or not P the probability one, well, then I will lose all my uh, pre my previous conditional uh, beliefs about uh, uh, what things would what things would be conditional to the, the uh, this uh, now adopted uh, full belief uh, not being true, uh, and this is also uh, a um, an irreversible process. So each time we make a probability revision in this way, if you think of the probability function being revised as a model of the development of the human belief system, that every revision leads to irreversible 
losses of beliefs. Once I have assigned the probability one to something, there is no way in which I can change it, and I don't have no idea about what I believe, would believe about other things if I change to adopt it. So, and, and this uh, we can call the uh, amnesia problem. It's at least one way to talk about it. Uh, it's a problem that we don't have in these um, uh, decotomous models, but on the other hand, side, the decotomous models are very limited since they only treat uh, the full beliefs and the rest is uh, just what you don't believe. Um, and, and, and with no degrees that correspond to, to what we would normally call uh, uh, degrees of beliefs. Uh, so uh, I will present in the pluralistic sense I just mentioned about uh, modeling of beliefs. I will present a way to deal with the amnesia problem of standard probability theory, which also makes it possible to include a dichotomous uh, belief model as part of a, a probabilistic model. Uh, and when I do this, I uh, want to emphasize that I want us to be able to have full beliefs uh, and to have uh, degrees of beliefs, but I don't think there should be a representation in which we uh, have a full belief and at the same time a, a a belief uh, that is uh, a probabilistic belief that is below one because that would not solve the, the cognitive, would not be meaningful. We have full beliefs in order to, to uh, avoid the complexities of uh, too many degrees of belief. A full belief settles all things and makes it easier to reason against that background. Um, so the the solution that I will uh, describe uh, is based on four rather simple components. Uh, the first of them is the use of infinitesimals to keep track of uh, currently rejected but still reinsertable possibilities. Now, infinitesimals uh, can be described as a sort of um, mathematical trick. They are additions to the standard number system, the real numbers, a positive infinitesimal is a number that is larger than zero, but smaller than all positive real numbers. Now you might say, well, how can they exist? Well, um, that is an intuitive question. Uh, anyhow, infinitesimals uh, are extremely useful uh, for, for many purposes, including some other purposes in, in, in probability theory, so they are a useful mathematical model. You don't need to use infinitesimals. I could have done this thing which I'm not going to describe with a, a series of vectors of numbers or other such constructions as well. I chose infinitesimals because they are uh, an elegant existing um, uh, solution to, to, to the problem of finding a model. So, uh, we can then replace standard probability theory by a hyperreal uh, probability theory, uh, which includes also the uh, infinitesimal numbers. So, instead of the close real valued interval between zero and one, we have the close uh, hyperreal valued interval between zero and one as uh, uh, the, the values or probabilities. Uh, and importantly, they, I, I propose to use them as one means of representing um, uh, lost beliefs or keeping track of uh, or memorizing lost uh, beliefs. Uh, I do not make any um, uh, metaphysical claims um, 
um, uh, at all. I just say that this is a model that uh, makes it possible to represent, represent some important features of the uh, human belief system. So suppose to take just one example that you are at a party and uh, you suddenly hear your friend Sarah's voice very clearly. You think you very uh, clearly can recognize her characteristic voice. So you draw the conclusion that she is at the party. Uh, and that means that you assign probability one to, um, in traditional sense, you assign probability one to uh, her being at the party. Uh, but if we have a, an infinite model based on infinitesimals, you assign a probability one minus an infinitesimal number that is an the number that is extremely closely to, to one, but is not one. Uh, and what is the trick with that? Well, the trick with that, the reason for that is that now you don't have to uh, uh, lose all your previous beliefs about uh, what would be the case if Sarah was at the party, uh, or, or so, so was not at the party. You, we still have, you might, for instance, have a belief that, well, I think she's probably at home. You might assign the probability uh, a, a one in two that she is at the home. Uh, but now that you hear her voice and conclude that she is here, so if you then use the standard probability revision, you will loss, lose any beliefs about where she would be if she was not at the party. Which is strange because if for some reason you find out that she isn't at the party, someone played a recording with her voice or, or she had a twin sister you didn't know of similar voice or whatever. Well, then you would immediately normally regain your belief. Well, I think she's probably at home or there's a half one in two chance that she's at home. Uh, whereas so, so this, because you, uh, this small infinitesimal number treated in just the standard way you, you, you calculate with probabilities would um, solve that problem. Uh, so that's the first component and perhaps uh, the most uh, disturbing component mathematically because it's something, it's, it's the use of infinitesimals in an area of probability theory where it's usually not used. Uh, the second component is a new definition of the set of full beliefs. The set of full beliefs will be in this model, uh, the um, set of beliefs that are either one or infinitesimally close to one. So infinitesimals are so to say probabilities that you don't worry about if you don't have to change your mind. So it's very simple to think of it like that. Uh, everything that is infinitesimally close to, has a probability infinitesimally close to one is, is a full belief. Uh, and uh, what's very interesting here is that the set of full beliefs will be logically closed, closed under logical consequence. And that is a, a very important uh, uh, property that makes this uh, model uh, easy to work with. And, and I would say also plausible. Uh, the third component is something which I've already sort of presupposed, namely that we have a way to revise by a sentence that doesn't give it probability one, but some lower probability. Now, we don't have to invent that because there is something called uh, Jeffrey conditionalization, which is uh, a, a very nice method to uh, not assigning probability one to a sentence, but it can be used to assign probability 0 0.3 or 0 0.92, whatever. Uh, uh, the Jeffrey conditionalization is the standard way to perform that type of revision, and it can easily be applied in this infinitesimal uh, framework. So uh, 
that is uh, in fact very simple. And then finally, the fourth component of this model uh, is a very simple restricted perspective, namely the perspective where we look only at this uh, set of full beliefs. So we can look at this model as a whole and see how uh, probabilities and probabilistic uh, uh, beliefs develop when an individual receives a set of um, uh, or, or a series of inputs and adopts new beliefs. We can see how the whole system develops, but we can also uh, look at it uh, by just considering the, the tip of the iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg is just a set of full beliefs. So if we have a probability function, the tip of the iceberg is the set of full beliefs in traditional uh, probability theory, that would be the set of beliefs with probability one. Here it also includes the beliefs uh, with a uh, uh, set of, uh, with um, uh, probabilities that are infinitesimally close to one. And as I said, the, um, it's, it will be equally nicely rounded off as in standard probability theory, because the tip of the iceberg will be um, um, closed uh, under logical consequence uh, in this case as well. <clears throat> now, it turns out that what we will then see will coincide for logically consistent inputs with what is usually regarded as the gold standard of dichotomous belief change, namely the AGM, full system of AGM uh, belief revision. So an operation of dichotomous belief change that we see working, so to say, by looking at what happens uh, with the tip of the iceberg, will in fact satisfy all the AGM uh, postulates. In this way, we have reconstructed uh, one, um, and as I said, the, 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 the gold standard version of uh, dichotomous belief change as part of a uh, model of uh, probabilistic belief change using infinitesimals as uh, the memory function, so to say, for, for, for the operations. Now, some of you might know that I have um, not, uh, I'm not uh, strongly uh, supporting all parts of all aspects of the AGM theory. I think that some of the, the postulates are uh, not very, plausible and that alternative models of dichotomous belief change can sometimes provide a better modeling of both of what we humans do and what we should do and also of what um, can be done by artificial agents. Uh, so this is not the end of the story. I think one should also investigate ways to achieve other uh, dichotomous models uh, in the same way. But uh, I see this as a sort of proof of concept. I don't think that the um, uh, um, use of infinitesimals is uh, the only way to do this. I'm looking at other approaches as well that can be used to the same effect and see if, if something turns out to be, be useful. Um, uh, and I don't think that we should assume that uh, degrees of beliefs always follow the laws of probability and how they are changed, or that the cotonous belief change always follows uh, uh, the uh, AGM postulates. But what I want to emphasize is that uh, uh, this, uh, this shows that we can model, have a model in which both degrees of beliefs and full beliefs are present and in which 
full beliefs uh, can be modified, can be, uh, can be uh, given up. And just one, once more, I want to, to emphasize, particularly against the background of where I started, that this is not the one and only representation of the dynamics of human belief. Other representations can cover some aspects better. Pluralism might seem dull and against certain ways in which we philosophers like to think, but I still think that pluralism has the, in philosophy, sometimes underrated advantage of being sensible. Thank you.